be talking about regimes of a different kind today. And um, I just want to start off with a little bit of a diagram to talk about um, what exactly it is that we're talking about, because it's, it's a little bit ambiguous, a little bit vague. But um, we're talking about struggles that are not anti-dictatorship, not state governments um, and people opponents like, you know, one versus the other. So as we, and I know we've been talking about that model a lot. A lot of this literature in strategic nonviolent action does come from a model that sort of has this people-state relationship. Um, and I think, you know, earlier in the week, we have looked at this concept of pillars of support. I'm going to draw a quick picture where, you know, this is the dictator or the government, the state itself. These are some of the pillars. Maybe we have the police, the education system, security forces, etc. cetera. Um, but we're going to be looking at sort of other entities that may have a relationship with the state, like a multinational corporation or Maybe they don't even have a relationship with the state, but they're operating within the boundaries of the state. So like another example we'll talk about today is illegal loggers, or we could talk about narco traffickers in different settings. But these aren't the only other types of struggles that we face. So if we have sort of like the people down here, who are being affected in this system of the state. But then we also have corporations who have a relationship with the state who have effects on the people as well. Or we have these sort of independent groups that are operating, maybe, maybe not in relation to the state, also affecting the people. And I think there's other struggles too, like we can talk about anti-corruption uh, struggles, um, struggles against there's, you can talk about uh, struggles against multinational corporations, for example, in Bolivia and Cochabamba. How many of you have heard of the example in 2000 where the water system in, in Cochabamba, Bolivia was privatized, water rates went up a thousand percent, and uh, people organized and rose up against it and were able to reverse that contract. Or struggles against nuclear power corporations by uh, my good friend and colleague, Al Giordano spent a lot of time organizing a few decades ago against uh, against nuclear power. Right now in Canada and the United States, there are many groups right now organizing against hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which many of you might know about, which is uh, a, a kind of extraction of natural gas from the ground that involves the injection of a lot of very toxic chemicals into, into aquifers. So people are organizing against uh, companies that are involved in that. And sometimes you'll have a relate, you'll have to uh, somehow work or take into account the role of government. For example, uh, governments regulate laws concerning fracking, but your primary opponent might be a, a gas drilling company in a particular area. So there are lots of different kinds of examples of that. Yeah, and so what we see is that oftentimes where there is either a lack of governance by the state or in some cases an absence of governance from the state, there um, are you know, rights abuses or um, conflicts taking place at local and national levels that are not necessarily, as Greg is saying, with the state, but is a result of the lack of the state doing its job. So in the case of corporations, oftentimes, this relationship is affecting the state's ability to do its job in protecting its citizens because it kind of prioritizes the corporate relationship over the people. So these are just a couple examples we want to throw out for you guys because we're going to start with a little bit of an exercise this morning. Yeah, now we're going to play another little bit of a game. <laughs> we have these uh, post-it notes here and uh, we also have a map here and uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to ask you to get uh, to break out into groups of about three or four people for just about five minutes or so and think about some of those kinds of struggles that you might know about not just uh, going on currently but that you may have known about or heard about or participated in throughout history, these kinds of struggles against an opponent which is not directly the state. So what we'd like you to do is write on these post-it notes uh, who was struggling, who their opponent was, where it was in the world, and around what time period. Uh, yes? Just a quick question. Does that include like subsets within the government? Like if the movement is targeting a particular section of the government, or is that also excluded? 
Um, well, the goal is to have the opponent be primarily non-government. Non okay, cool. But obviously, like we just said, it might oftentimes involve uh, two opponents at once. Okay. But the primary opponent is something that a non-governmental organization is, or something that is not a government is engaged in. Okay, so the cool. primary opponent is not the government. Cool, thanks. Right. Okay, so uh, if you want to start. Could you just yes. mention those questions? I mean, what all we need to write, sure. what, yeah. got, what the information okay. you want to So who is struggling? Who was the opponent? Where in the world was it? And when did it happen? So if you guys start to uh, organize yourselves into groups of three or four, please, with the, your neighbors, don't get up and move around. Just whoever's next to you. And also, I know some of you are, are, are leaving Boston in a few days. Don't use the post-it notes for shopping lists or anything like that. Uh, I'll come around with you. Okay, so as, you, as, as we obviously saw, as we obviously saw, there are no shortage of these kinds of struggles around the world. There are many, they're varied, and they're all around the world. Uh, we thought we'd just go over and name a few of the struggles that you put here on the board. And I imagine just because the area doesn't have a place somewhere in the world, For example, Latin America and China. This one's good. Oh, it's quite the earliest. Australia as well, my gosh. There are some big gaps. There are some big gaps, yeah. Okay, I think, I think Mary's put on the example. Uh, Mary put down the example of. Uh, of the, of the Egyptian power ordering uh, Jewish women to kill their firstborn in uh, 1300 BCE, and women disobeyed. So yes, that's that's uh, a form of nonviolent resistance. Uh, some of the more current struggles include uh, environmental groups struggling against dam building in Iran, a struggle that that uh, has gone on from 2002 to the to the present. In Colombia, we have trade unions struggling against Coca-Cola Corporation. Uh, we have, if we could have silence, please. Uh, we have in Mongolia gold mining companies, uh, people struggling against gold mining companies right now. Uh, in West Papua, people struggling against the Freeport Company, and we're going to hear more about that very soon. Farm laborers getting unfair wages in the grape industry in the 1970s. And uh, people organizing against Japanese whaling in the Pacific Ocean. It's gone on from the 1980s to the present. So we have most of the world represented here. Uh, and we've got quite a number of struggles. And at the end, when we go into Q&A, we might talk a little bit more about some of these specific struggles. But as you can see, there's no shortage of these examples. And Althea is going to tell you more about one struggle that she's watched very closely. Great, thanks. So yeah, I mean, I think I think you know what we would like to do here is just really harvest some of the examples that you all know, so that we can also be speaking to examples that resonate with you and that you're familiar with. And while there are some gaps here, you know, there's a wide range of examples. And I think part of the point of this session is to really just focus on the fact that that the types of nonviolent struggles that we see in the world are not all anti-dictatorship. So what makes these struggles different? What makes them unique? What do they have in common? What makes them different? How do we need to approach facing these types of struggles, especially when we have more than one opponent, in different ways than we do a dictatorship struggle? So um, as Greg just mentioned, I'm going to go into um, a, a mini presentation on the case of Freeport McMorrin in um, West Papua. Let me just pull up. Slideshow. Okay. So, um, as some of you know, I graduated from Fletcher in 2011 in May. And the topic of this presentation on corporate social responsibility and the role of civil resistance looking at the case of Freeport Mining in West Papua comes out of the research that I did for my master's thesis here. So, um, and I just want to recognize that we have a couple of Indonesians in the audience, so please feel free to, um, you know, jump in, raise your hand, butt in, correct me, whatever you want. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of background on just the concept of corporate social responsibility as like a framework from which I have arrived at this case study. Um, really the question of corporate social responsibility today comes out of a question about 
what uh, is the role of business in society, and it comes out of looking at what some of the impacts of business have had in society. So obviously we have a, a slew of different impacts that um, businesses, especially large multinational corporations, have um, on local communities and uh, regional economies and um, really the global economy. Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved in corporate activities. These are just a few to get your juices flowing. Um, and also to think about really sort of who, um, who have interests at stake, who might be some of the pillars of a corporate entity or of the relationship between a corporation, a government, and the people. Um, so one of the concepts that I, I, I looked at was this idea of corporate governance. So how do we regulate multinational corporations in the global economy, especially um, when we have uh, companies that um, have you know, revenues, net revenues, uh, annual revenues that are larger than the GDPs of many countries? Um, and so when we talk about corporate governance, it's really just this nebulous idea. Um, this is one definition that I was working with, set of processes, customs, policies, laws, and institutions affecting the way that a corporation or a company is directed, administered, or controlled, and it includes relationships with the stakeholders that were, um, some of which were listed in the last slide. So we have some global initiatives and instruments. Um, there are, these are basically a set of different types of soft international law. Um, because corporations are not states, they're not really regulated under the international legal um, regime. So, um, you know, international law really is a state to state relationship. And because the corporation is not a state, um, there's a different sort of set of soft principles that have been established, which a lot of companies will sort of sign on to and agree to. But it's a voluntary system, um, and there's no accountability mechanisms for any of these. Um, and these are just a set of ones that are out there. Uh, I want to just add one which is the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which some believe has become a normative or, or an international norm as far as the regulation of corporations as well as states and, and individuals. Um, and one of the evidences of that is that in a lot of corporations, I, would, I think the stat is maybe like around 30% of multinational corporations have direct language from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in their own bylaws or in their own sort of um, statement of how they govern themselves or how they will operate as a business. Um, so corporate social responsibility is an evolving concept and like I said it comes out of this idea of you know what role should business play in society um, it's become more mainstream I'd say in the last 20 to 25 years um, there's a lot of business around this business so there's a lot of people trying to figure out what does it mean how do we define it how do we measure it um, how do we provide consultancies for multinational corporations in order to get them to perform better or behave socially responsibly um, and yeah, so there's just kind of this an increase in a, and a lot of people say that this increase in awareness or a sort of pressure for corporate responsibility in the world comes from an increasing awareness of the negative impacts of those business operations. So we see with, um, you know, the Exxon Valdez spill or with BP in, um, in the United States just, just a couple years ago, uh, a lot of media attention around the negative impacts that uh, multinational corporations can have on communities and the environment and health. Um, and people are really sort of increasing their demands in a general sense globally for, the responsi for, for, for businesses to act in a socially responsible manner. Corporate citizenship is another concept that comes out of sort of this history of what is the role of business in society. Um, in many senses, uh, when businesses first, sorry, first, um, when corporations really were first getting started, some of them, some people say that they really felt that their purpose in society was to do good. Um, and of course we see a lot of different types of negative impacts that come out of them, but as a part of their uh, envisioned role in society, um, there was this sense that they had this duty to give back to the communities that they live in, and there was really just this overall sense that businesses thrive when communities thrive. So we need people who are well fed, who have um, resources to feed themselves, that are educated and skilled to be a part of our workforce, and so the corporation wanted to contribute to creating that sort of environment which inevitably would benefit them as well. So it started with a lot of uh, sort of corporate philanthropy in local communities where businesses were located, and now as we're in a more sort of global and, and massive big business or multinational corporation um, 
state uh, in, in the world today, it's become this, this bigger notion of corporate citizenship and obligation to um, behave as a, as a um, responsible citizen of the world. Sure. You, yeah. I just wanted to, sorry, going back a couple slides ago, where you talked about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, I'll use the term should. Shouldn't it be government's responsibility to regulate these corporations and therefore governments that have, that have been signatories to various instruments or agreements should make them binding on those corporations or at least enforce them? Yeah, so um, I think I'll probably address it on this challenges slide itself, but um, yes, like the way that international law works is that a state should be regulating that business within its own country. Right. But it becomes very complicated when you have a corporation that's based in the United States that's operating in Indonesia, and um, neither of those states has a desire to bring that international legal body or that sort of that that group of principles and laws neither of them have an interest in bringing those issues um, you know into those sort of international legal mechanisms space so um, there's really so yes and then that we in addition to international law we have the domestic law of both countries uh, and we see in many cases that you know the the host country, in this case it will be Indonesia, um, also doesn't have much of an incentive to enforce its own law, domestic laws on this corporation because the benefits that they're getting from that company really outweigh in terms of the way that they may um, evaluate why they might regulate the company or not. They're getting too much money, too much revenue, too much um, incentives from that corporation being there. And part of that comes out of the power relationships that exist because of the power of the multinational corporation in today's world. So I'm just going to go through a couple of, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, I was just pointing out, you know, what should be an instrument, and then of course, act, in actuality, is it an instrument? Exactly. So we're finding that also with the voluntary mechanisms that I listed earlier, which is that, um, you know, the voluntary mechanisms or principles that companies sign on to, they just don't work. And they don't work because the companies sign on to them, but in many cases, they're just not adhering to the, their own um, agreements. So, um, so some of the challenges that we have with this model of corporate governance or corporate citizenship is that um, despite the fact that corporations might have a strategic interest in doing so, they are not performing in socially responsible ways. And this is not across the board, um, but in this uh, research that I did, I was looking primarily at extractive industries and specifically mining companies. Um, so these global instruments, the international laws, are non-biting on corporations, and there's a lack of incentive of these states to um, enforce those international laws with each other, a lot of times for political reasons. Um, there's an overall lack of accountability mechanisms for corporations. Um, the host governments, in this case it will be Indonesia, they have a vested interest in um, having that mining company there. Um, they need foreign direct investment. Um, they get a lot of monetary benefits from that company. Sometimes they're a partial shareholder in the company, in this case they are. Um, and they really see that as their primary interest over um, sort of some of the negative effects that can come with that same relationship. Um, companies themselves are failing to provide mechanisms for addressing grievances by, um, by the people or by communities that they are affecting, and these voluntary principles are just not working. So this is where we get to the case that I'm going to talk about today, which is um, the case of Freeport McMoran. It's a U.S.-based mining company. It's based in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it used to be based in Louisiana. And we're talking about their operations in West Papua, which is currently a part of Indonesia. Um, it's the, uh, well, I'll get into that as well. Um, the Freeport McMoran mine in West Papua is the largest copper and gold mine or reserves in the world today. Um, it's in a country or a part of Indonesia. Uh, it's called West Papua or Papua and West Papua are two provinces together um, that has an indigenous population. It's a very remote location. Freeport has a very long history and record of vast environmental abuses, um, environmental destruction, human rights abuses, um, land seizures that were allowed during the Suharto regime in Indonesia um, that did not involve the free prior informed consent of the communities there. Um, there are really deep historical grievances in Papua. Papua right now um, has one, has a pretty massive um, 
nonviolent movement for independence within which the resistance that I will talk about today sort of exists. So um, you have to look at sort of the bigger picture. I'm going to be looking at two campaigns that deal very specifically with Freeport, but it's in the context of a desire for West Papua to be independent um, that these sort of deep historical grievances exist. Um, there is a lack of international pressure on the company or on Indonesia at all to do um, much in Papua. It's very much um, a like sort of unknown struggle to most of the world. Um, and so this movement for independence is is happening sort of overarching and within that there are actions that are being taken against Freeport because of the relationship that it has with the Indonesian government, um, which makes them sort of intertwined as far as their struggle for independence. Um, and we see an asymmetric conflict. This is something that we talk about in terms of uh, why people use nonviolent actions. We have um, a very powerful company that is operating in a remote area, and the people have very little leverage against that company in terms of um, sort of the, the, the power relation between that, the company and the government and the people. So I want to put up a map because some people don't know where West Papua is. Um, it is, I don't have a pointer, but we're looking at the western half of the island of New Guinea. So we have a bunch of islands that make up Indonesia up there, and West Papua is really this lighter portion before you get to New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. So the history of Freeport McMoran is really important because, um, because the, 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 the movement for independence in West Papua comes out of uh, what some call a failed decolonization process. So the Dutch were um, the colonizers of Indonesia, and during the decolonization process, Indonesia wanted to um, assume West Papua as a part of Indonesia. And um, this was a contested thing at the time. Um, and so what they did is they kind of put West Papua into this limbo period for a couple years where um, they were neither independent nor officially a part of Indonesia. And they used that time to sort of um, figure out what they were going to do. And they ended that, that period of time with what they called the act of free choice, um, which was a referendum. Um, a lot of people say it was neither free nor fair, but that um, people were held at gunpoint and um, you know, voted for integration into Indonesia. The votes were 100% in favor of um, integration, and uh, that's oftentimes also part of the evidence for um, how it was not free or fair. So before this act of free choice happened in which Indonesia did get official control of West Papua, um, Indonesia gave the mining rights to Freeport before they really had official territorial control over that portion. So that's really important because like, the grievances that come out of this decolonization process are very much tied to Freeport's ability to get the land rights and the mineral rights to, um, to mine there when they didn't even have um, control over the, over the, over the territory. Um, Freeport had a very, very close relationship with Suharto, which gave them pretty much um, free reign on the land and the ability to take over whatever they needed in order to do their mining operations. And because Suharto um, you know, governed as a dictator, there were many things about Freeport's approach to establish, establishing itself in West Papua that were done in a sort of dictatorial manner as well. Um, and so we see a lot of human rights abuses, environmental destruction, again, um, the marginalization of indigenous community, uh, a lack of consent, and no inclusion in their decision making about um, the lands that, that, they, that they owned. Um, and I think it's important to bring back, again, the fact that you know, the communities in, in Papua are indigenous, and they depend very heavily on those lands. So their very livelihoods and ability to continue to exist and live in the manner that they do depend on their ability to have that land. So when they're kicked off the land, um, part, they're losing all kinds of things in terms of their ability to sort of survive in, in different ways. This is just a, um, a couple aerial views of the Grassberg mine in Papua. Um, I included this, this photo of these trucks because it's sometimes important to just get a sense of how massive these <laughs> operations really are. Um, and so you can see these individuals are standing next to just a regular sort of pickup truck and then the massive machinery that is required to do the digging to get these massive holes in the earth. Um, and uh, these are all really, really foreign things to Papuans. So um, that's just part of the reason why I put this here, too. Um, but you can just see the, you know, how big the largest copper and gold mine in the world really looks um, from the air. 
So we have this cultural context of the Amungmi and Comoro people whose lands um, the Freeport mine uh, currently exists on. Um, and it, I, another point to make about about the mountains here is that the mountain that they um, that they were mining is considered the mother mountain. It's a part of sort of a historical. Um, traditional identity around the creation of Papua. And so it's not just any mountain, it is a mountain that has a lot of spiritual and cultural importance and significance to the people. Yes? I think what you uh, say is sound exactly like this is Avatar. Mm -hmm. In a way for us to understand what the mountain is and something from your head, you must watch the film because in yeah. most of the places for indigenous communities, the, the, the mountains or the rivers or the, or the forests are exactly like uh, something very heavenly and spiritual. Like yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of people use this reference too to talk about Papua. A lot of people like like to use that example. So, um, okay. So this is a photo I took from an airplane. It's just um, it's basically I just wanted to show you also the the environmental impact. This is um, this is sort of it was a river and then it was um, dumped with tailings and tailings are one of the massive environmental problems that all mining companies face because when you take all of this rock out of the earth and sift through it for the actual ores, you have a ton, tons and tons and tons and tons of waste, and it's really difficult to figure out where to put it. So Freeport has put it in the rivers, which, uh, again, the people depend on for fish and for livelihoods and for water and for all kinds of things. And this is an example or just an image that shows, um, you can see kind of the stick figures. It used to be a forest, and there's also rivers uh, running through here and all of the gray stuff is the tailings it's the rock waste that they've poured into it this is another image you can just kind of get a better sense also on that little mini island there there are people I don't know if you can see them or not but um, there's also like a string of people up there and those are um, what they call artisanal miners so small scale miners who are sifting through the waste rock for the leftover ore that Freeport didn't get out of the, the rock initially um, there is a history of both violent and nonviolent action in Papua. Um, it's important to talk about the OPM is a movement that emerged during the decolonization process during this period of two years of in limbo as a way of really fighting for Papuan independence. Um, they employed both violent and nonviolent tactics, but um, are generally characterized as being violent as part of the narrative that Indonesia tells about um, the, the sort of security risk that is Papua. Um, there's a history of nonviolent resistance to Freeport. Landowners from the very beginning um, did, were conducting various types of protests, sit-ins, et cetera, to protect their land and eventually were kicked off. Um, they have engaged in advocacy and legal efforts um, as well. There's been two different lawsuits by communities in Papua against Freeport, um, some in the U.S. courts in an attempt to hold Freeport responsible for the human rights abuses that have taken place. So this is another example of trying to use domestic law um, and the domestic laws of the United States, which govern Freeport McMorrin in order to try and hold them accountable, but neither of them were successful. Um, in 1996, we saw some protests in Freeport that were um, uh, were responded to with a lot of, uh, a lot of repression, um, but there was a little bit of concessions there. So I'm going to talk about two campaigns for workers' rights. These are the stories I want to just get into before I take up too much more time. Um, they were both strategically organized and planned nonviolent campaigns. Um, they were both an attempt to shift Freeport's corporate social responsibility policies and practices, although they don't use this language when they talk about it. Um, when we put it in the framework that I've just sort of discussed, that's essentially what they were doing. Um, they, these campaigns, although they were workers' rights campaigns um, of the workers that are working within Freeport, they also both implicitly and explicitly were addressing the bigger grievances of Papuan independence and some of the concerns of local landowners and the history of, of um, this exploitation. Um, and they were rights-based <coughs> campaigns focused on workers' rights. So the first one was um, the Tangoi Papua Workers' Strike of 2007. Here are some of the problems that Papuan workers were facing. Another important thing to mention is that um, a part of uh, Suharto policies, but also uh, since Suharto has, has left office, um, there's been a, a, a movement for transmigration. So um, this is sort of like a redistribution of people in the country. It's a, encouraging people to move to Papua. So um, because we have an indigenous population in Papua, and then we have Indonesians who are ethnically, culturally, et cetera, different, but moving into Papua is part of staking claim of the land, but also um, integrating sort of Papua into Indonesia in different ways. 
Um, so at the Freeport Mine, which um, currently employs about 22,000 sort of um, uh, workers, uh, not management, but you know, sort of more mainstream workers, um, there was a, a problem with the discrimination of, of hiring Papuan workers. So um, there was threats and intimidation of Papuan workers who were trying to address their grievances as Papuans. Um, there's a lot of discrimination of Papuans in general in Papua by Indonesian migrants um, and by sort of the system, the bigger system, which includes obviously Freeport. Um, they were having a difficulty getting hired, promoted, um, getting sort of worker development in different ways or you know, learning new skills. Um, and because of this influence, influence and influx of Indonesian migrants, um, you know, the percentage of Papuan workers versus Indonesian migrant workers was something like 20% to 80%, even though Papuans at the time outnumbered the Indonesian migrants as a population. Um, so there was this preference for hiring Indonesian migrant workers, and the Papuans wanted to have more, uh, ha more people working within the mine. So they formed a union called Tangoi Papua that was a Papuan-specific union. So it was, it was uh, organized and for Papuan workers in response to these issues. Um, they, when they formed Tangoi Papua, they, they carried out a series of consultations with their Papuan workers, um, submitted their grievances to Freeport, uh, who did not respond to this official letter. They continued to follow up over a year-long period, and when they had no response, they went, you know, they decided amongst the, the union that they were going to strike. They um, gave notice to the company that they were going to strike if they didn't respond in the next 30 days. And um, when they did not hear anything from the company after those 30 days, um, they, uh, they implemented that strike. And one important thing to note is that they did reduce this sort of huge list of grievances that they had into three limited and achievable demands. And they were an increase of the minimum wage for mine workers, which would not just affect Papuan workers, but Indonesian workers as well. Um, they wanted to create a special department to deal with the, this um, sort of hiring and promoting of Papuan workers within the workforce. And they wanted to get rid of a list of employees and management at Freeport, that's what PTFI stands for, um, that had been identified by Papuan workers as being particularly discriminatory um, or particularly difficult in terms of um, intimidations and threats for trying to organize. They organized workers, including non-Papuan workers. They talked to each other um, when they were working during the day. They um, educated the workers about sort of what this, what the situation was, um, because some Indonesian migrant workers were not necessarily aware. Um, they they stuck with these three limited and achievable goals. They purposefully and strategically did not associate the strike with this broader independence movement for fear that one, they would turn off the participation of the Indonesian migrants who are not in favor of independence, and two, because it would uh, likely increase the repression of the strike be from the Indonesian security forces that operate in Papua. Um, they made it very clear that they were not intending to close the mine, which were demands of some some people uh, in the in the Papuan area or in the living in and around the, the Freeport area, um, they just wanted to improve the worker conditions. Um, that would have also been a controversial demand or um, you know really extreme uh, by the view of many people. So um, they formed strategic allies, not just with non-Papuan workers, but also with the police force in uh, in Papua. They were able to sort of um, alert them of the strike ahead of time and get their support in terms of uh, not repressing the strike or the, the subsequent public demonstrations. And they planned ahead of time for nonviolent discipline. They had rules in place as far as these public demonstrations. They um, required all workers to wear their uniform in order to be able to identify them. They, were, they strongly discouraged people to drink before coming to public demonstrations in order to maintain sort of a calmer um, uh, uh, mood at the demonstrations and, and would not let people in to the demonstrations that, that hadn't sort of followed some of these rules. So they went on strike. They got 15, somewhere between 15 and 18,000 workers to go on strike out of this 20 to 22,000. Um, and they, the day that they, that they went on strike, they marched from D Tembagapur to Timika. I'm just going to show you this photo. Um, the mine is located, you know, really high up in uh, altitude. The mountains in Papua are just are really uh, stark in terms of the steepness of the, um, you know, from sea level up into the uh, where the mine actually exists. And um, the road that you see there is is a 60 is something like a 60 mile long road um, that leads from uh, the top into the city of Timika. So. It's just kind of trying to show the, the march that they're gonna that they're gonna go on. So they marched from the top here um, down into the city of Timika, 
And um, at one point, the, what, what happens is that the, the marches, it takes way too long. It would take like two, you know, a day maybe for them to walk from the top to the bottom. So the company ended up sending buses and busing them down to Tamika. This is just um, an image of some of the, the workers in the public demonstration in their uniforms or, you know, with the, some of them had their hard hats on that day. Um, in this instance, um, it, it took only four days for Freeport to go into media negotiations and agree to all three demands. So um, they were successful in, in, um, in getting those three demands, although when we spoke with some of the Tongoi Papuan uh, union leaders in July of last year, they said that um, of those three demands, really only the wage increase had um, taken effect. Um, the, there was a department created for Papuan workers, but it, they say there's still challenges around it. And um, some of those uh, problematic uh, management workers were also fired, but not all of them. So there continues to be um, grievances in the workforce, which leads us to the second example, the second case or the second campaign, which was um, another workers' strike by a different union. This is SPSI. It's the all workers' union, so it's not Papuan specific. Um, it's led by an Indonesian whose name is Sudiro right now. Um, they really were facing an inability to freely organize as workers. Under Suharto, unions were not allowed whatsoever. So in some senses, the, the union culture and the ability to organize as workers is still getting formed, and um, people are still testing the waters as far as what they can actually do as a union. Um, they were also fi facing a lot of intimidation and threats as union leaders trying to organize their workers. And um, Freeport continued to ignore the demands that the workers brought forth. So under Sudiro's leadership, which um, started about a year or two ago, uh, I don't know the exact date, but he really um, he came uh, from the lower ranks of the workers and really worked his way up as somebody that was trying to help workers deal with grievances within the company. And then he was elected to lead this official union um, for, for all of the workers. Um, and he started with doing a lot of investigation around union organizing and trying to educate the union and the union members themselves about um, what does it mean to be a union organizer, what can we do, or how do we do this exactly. Um, and they also did a lot of research about peaceful resistance. They, were, um, they said that they were influenced by Japanese workers who had um, peacefully sort of sat in, and they, they had seen this on TV, and they were you know, doing investigation around it. But Sudiro, the important part is that he really emphasized information gathering and education of the workers about the information that they were gathering. And I just want to make a plug for those two things in organizing in general. You can never underestimate. So during this information gathering, what they found out is that the wages of Papuan, or excuse me, of all of the workers in the mine at Freeport in West Papua, um, the, the wages were about $1.50 an hour to about $3 an hour. And what they found out is that in Freeport, McMoran mines in other countries, the same jobs were getting a range of $15 an hour to $30 an hour. So this is a huge discrepancy between the wages that they're paying in another country than they were in Indonesia in this Papuan mine. And mind you, this is the biggest, largest copper and gold mine in the world. Freeport's making a lot of money off of this mine. And so this injustice that they were seeing and, and just the unfairness in having a different wage for Papua than they were in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in Mongolia, countries that are you know, in similar states of development, you might say, as um, Papua specifically, um, were getting paid so much better. Um, but there was another series of events that happened. Uh, after these wage discrepancies, the union under Sudiro's leadership was trying to bring some of these issues to the, to the management. Um, and as a part of uh, the intimidation by the, by the company, um, they, they pulled a couple of fast moves. The first thing they did is they de-recognized SPSI as the official union of Freeport. And they kind of created their own new union that was like a company union, but there was no members. So they just decided. <laughs> They decided, we're not going to recognize you all anymore. We're going to create this other one. Um, and we're going to start dealing with this union instead. So when they de-recognized SVSI, they also refused to go into their typical every two-year collective labor agreements, at which point some of these issues might have been addressed. And so when they wouldn't go into collective labor agreement with SPSI, um, you know, they SPSI was like basically losing its leverage as a union to really um, communicate their grievances to the management. Um, and the final straw was really the firing of SPSI union leaders from their jobs at Freeport with no explanation. Um, and it was at that point that um, people decided that they really wanted to do something. 
And so again, they decided to strike. Um, they, they formed a couple of new strategic allies, uh, specifically with the seven leaders of the, or the leaders of the seven local tribes, which is a pretty powerful sort of um, political, informal political group in, the, in that area of Timika, where the mine exists. Um, when they voted within the union, all representatives voted 100% that they wanted to strike. On July 4th of last year, they, um, they went on strike. There were around 12,000 members of SPSI at the time after they had done this sort of educating and organizing in order to grow their union. Uh, and almost 100% of those union members participated in the strike. Eight days later, Freeport agreed to enter into the collective labor agreements with SPSI and to sort of re-recognize them as a union temporarily during that period of the collective labor agreement. But the negotiations failed pretty quickly. Um, it was clear that SPSI, who was armed with this information about the wages in Mongolia and DRC, had really radically different expectations for what kind of wage increases they were going to get in these negotiations than what Freeport was really going to be willing to, um, to, to give. Um, uh, SPSI felt that Freeport was not negotiating in good faith, um, and so they went back to their union leaders and to their representatives and to the workers, and um, they went for a vote, and it was a unanimous decision to strike once again. The second part of the strike is a three-month-long workers' strike. Um, it's the longest workers' strike or industrial action that's ever taken place in Indonesia. Um, there, uh, there were a series of things that happened, and I'm going to try and keep it simple and wrap up real quick. But um, essentially, uh, Freeport stopped paying workers who were striking, which is in violation of the law in Indonesia. Um, and the way that they went about doing this was saying, well, we don't recognize SPSI as an official union, and so therefore we don't have to pay them for their not working because they're not actually doing it within the legal system either. Um, there was a letter from SBSI at this point to Freeport Management, Indonesian government officials, and the president of Indonesia explaining again what their demands were, what the issues were, what the problems were, and um, why the negotiations had failed and what they were still demanding. Um, the International Federation for Chemical Energy Mine Workers is an international body that sort of um, is, is uh, International Body for Workers of these types of companies issued a letter in support of the striking workers. Um, there was a public statement by the CEO of Freeport, uh, you know, reiterating their commitment to the Papuan, uh, to all of the workforce at the Papua mine in, in Grassburg. Um, the Indonesian Energy Minister also made a statement around uh, around this time in which he, you know, stated that the Indonesian government was losing 6.7 million dollars a day because of the strike. So that's just the Indonesian government, let alone the company itself, which is making a lot more. Uh, and then the dock workers went on strike. And this was another strategic ally that the workers at SPSI uh, had made during some of their sort of um, background organizing. And the dock workers are really important because the dock workers enable the ore from the mine to be shipped out of Indonesia and for Freeport to continue making money off of the ore. Um, they're also important because because of the mine being there, there's a lot of um, international expat workers and people who rely on the imports into Papua of um, luxury goods that they want to enjoy, despite the fact that they're living in, in Papua and can't really get access to those. Um, at one point, Freeport attempted to bus in replacement workers, um, which the SPSI workers blockaded and protested. Um, there was uh, violence by security forces at this in intersection of the bus workers trying to get into Freeport and, and the SPSI workers blocking them. Um, and ultimately, the, the bust in workers were not really able to do their job, and Freeport ended up halting their production altogether, which is a major, major thing for a mining company to do. It's really difficult to get these kinds of operations up and running. So when you stop them, you're not just stopping one thing, you're stopping a huge, massive project. Again, think about that image of that mine being so huge. So again, 94 days of striking, so three month long strike. Between 8,000 and 12,000 workers participated. There was violence by the security forces, but not by the, um, the protesters or the, or the workers themselves, but it did result in 26 shooting deaths, uh, or 16 deaths and 26 incidents. Um, there's a couple other things going on in Papua during this time that are a little bit complicated to go into, but there was a meeting of, of Papuan political groups 
uh, for the first time in many years, and there was a lot of violence around that as well. So there was kind of a really heightened tension in Papua in general, which kind of enabled these um, public actions and these protests and blockades to have a sort of heightened sense of security risk for the security forces, although they're always on high alert in Papua. Um, Freeport was losing about $15 million a day because of the halted productions. Um, and uh, when the strike ended uh, after three months, the terms of this negotiated agreement was that they would give the workers a 37% wage increase, um, housing allowances. There was a number of demands around health issues and pension funds. Um, so there was a retirement savings plan as a part of the deal, um, and they and they were able to just you know get some of these um, agreements agreed to. Uh, what they're facing right now really is the implementation of those promises, and that's always the case. There are threats again that the workers will go on strike sometime this summer because of some delay in these implementations or frustrations among the workers that this is not actually a genuine um, uh, a genuine uh, granting of these terms. So um, we see some small victories in Papua and I think we see bigger trends in general of um, worldwide recognition and awareness of the use of nonviolent action in non-dictatorship uh, or non-state uh, types of conflicts, um, and specifically around corporate behavior and corporate social responsibility. So I'm going to end there, hand it over to Greg. Uh, while I'm being Mike, let me just say that you know from our presentation yesterday that I spend most of my time making uh, political satire in Mexico, but although this might sound counterintuitive, uh, making satire can actually make you go crazy. And for my own sanity, sometimes I have to write serious articles, right? Um, so the story that I'm going to tell you today is based on uh, something that's happened over the past few years in the town of Chiran in Mexico, in the state of Michoacan, but that I learned about writing a story for Narco News. Uh, to begin with, yesterday we saw the story of uh, This is Maria, right? We saw that video. Before you saw that video, how many of you had heard that there was a war on drugs going on in Mexico? Not so bad, but here's... Yeah, well, exactly. Especially you, Tesla. <laughs> but here, but here's the question, and here's the question for everybody: How many of you had heard before yesterday that there was actually a movement against the war on drugs going on in Mexico? Not so bad. Pretty good, actually. Ah, okay. Not so bad. Not so bad. But it's still obviously much fewer people had heard that that there is a movement going on against the war on drugs in Mexico. Now what's interesting about this case is that it's the case of an indigenous town struggling against illegal logging perpetrated by organized crime in their community. But you can't talk about it without talking about the drug war. Now one of the funniest things about the war on drugs is that it has almost nothing to do with stopping the flow of drugs. It's been going on for roughly 40 years since it was officially declared by Richard Nixon as public policy. But it has existed in a much more accelerated and intensive fashion in Mexico since 2006. Now in 2006, there were presidential elections in Mexico. We're also going to see presidential elections coming in Mexico this coming Sunday. Now, many of us, including myself, believe, based on the best available evidence that we have, that the winner of those elections in 2006 was not actually Felipe Calderón, the current president of Mexico, but Andrés Manuel López Obrador. After Felipe Calderón was elected president, there were massive protests against uh, what many, including myself, believe to be electoral fraud in the streets, and when Calderon did finally take office, he had to do so literally under cover of night. He had to run into the Congress at, at five minutes to midnight, um, give a kind of abbreviated 30-second version of his, uh, of his swearing-in ceremony and run out. Uh, so he came into the presidency extremely, extremely weakened. So like many heads of state, one of the first things that he did once he took power was to declare a war against an enemy. Uh, his official 
rationale for that enemy was, was his official enemy was uh, what he called organized crime. And he said that in order to combat organized crime and drug trafficking organizations, that he would start to use the military, the army, to do police work in most parts of the country to stop those drug trafficking organizations and to stop organized crime. Now, you have to understand that the drug war actually makes a lot of money for a lot of different people. The war on drugs requires a lot of contracts to companies in the United States from Motorola to, uh, to uh, Sikorsky. American Express. American, well, th there's so many industries that benefit from the war on drugs. And the fact of the matter is, is that there is a very porous relationship between government authorities in Mexico and organized crime. So uh, while a lot of money, a lot of effort is spent against trying to supposedly stop the activities of drug trafficking organizations in Mexico, and as we've seen over the last few years, there have been anywhere between 50,000 and 90,000 people killed in Mexico because of the, the war on drugs, the fact of the matter is that the percent reduction in the flow of drugs to the United States is zero. So obviously that begs the question, what's really going on here? One very clear example of the, uh, the, the real on the ground effects that the war on drugs has for communities in Mexico can be seen in the town of Chiran. Uh, in 2007, very soon after Calderon took office, he sent the military to the state of Michoacan, which is his home state. Now, Michoacan is a, is a very politically volatile state because there's a rivalry there between his party, the PAN, the National, the National Action Party, and the PRD, the center-left uh, party that currently holds the governorship there. The town of Chiran got caught in this crossfire. The town of Chiran is an indigenous Purépecha town. It has about 18,000 inhabitants. And at that time, in 2007, it had roughly 28,000 acres of, or 27,000 hectares, rather, of uh, communal land, most of it forested. 27,000 hectares, if I remember correctly, my conversions is roughly 66,000 acres, more or less. Now, it's a town that makes its living off of commerce. It's an easily accessed town that is a gateway to much more rural and much more difficult to access communities in the forest and in the mountains. So it makes its living uh, by selling goods and, and, uh, and, and wholesale items to a lot of those communities. They don't generally engage in commercial logging. The logging that they do is sustenance logging. Now, coincidentally, coincidentally, very soon after the army arrived to Michoacan and was stationed very near the town of Chiran, illegal logging in the area accelerated quickly. Imagine that. Now, from 2008 to 2011, of those 27,000 hectares of forest that belong to the community, 20,000 of those hectares were logged, 20,000. So that's three quarters of their, roughly, of their communal land. Uh, the forest is very important to them for all sorts of reasons, culturally, spiritually, ecologically. And not only that, when organized gangs came into the town and into the forest to log, they would also harass, rob, uh, and do worse things to members of the community. In 2008, the community got fed up and started to confront the loggers in the forest, and three people from the community were killed. Outraged, the town spontaneously decided to uh, temporarily occupy the uh, city hall in the town. But this was more or less a spontaneous uprising 
and there wasn't much organization or planning involved. Now, again, I want to be clear. There is no, I have no proof that the military is involved directly in uh, illegal logging there. I have not seen direct proof. You, some people suspect, as people do from the town, that the military is involved in protecting those that are logging there. But at the very least, what is unquestionable is that the military is not suited for police work. It never is and never can be in any country. Uh, milit armies are trained to uh, bomb buildings, uh, go in and fight an enemy. They're not trained to do police work. So this can never work. In 2011, the town decided once again to confront organized crime in the town. But this time they did so in a much more different way, in a much more organized way. Women and uh, older children from the community confronted loggers as they were coming into the town and told them that they were sick of what they were doing. They removed the mayor from office. They occupied the offices, saying that they had enough evidence to prove that uh, the municipal offices of the town were protecting the loggers. They set up 200, uh, you could say, this is an interesting thing, they called them campfires around the town to uh, watch the activities of people coming into the town from the outside. Now this is really interesting because there's a long history of, uh, of indigenous communities and communities in general in Mexico uh, facing corrupt authorities that decide to set up their own security in their towns. This happened on a massive scale in Oaxaca in 2006 when uh, the, this is the capital of the state of Oaxaca was occupied by a, a largely nonviolent citizens movement for five months, longer than, than the, uh, the, the Paris Commune. They called, they called them barricades along the town and this gave the commercial media a chance to really demonize the concept of what a barricade was and make them seem like they were, they were, they were militant uh, armed checkpoints throughout the city. It was a very smart use of language in the case of Chiran to call these, uh, what essentially were barricades to call them, campfires. Because what does it make you think of? Marshmallows, right? <laughs> In fact, they actually were toasting marshmallows. Uh, women and children uh, would take shifts alongside men, telling stories, cooking food, having fun, talking about their own history and culture. And there was a kind of civic renaissance in the, in the town of Chiran while they occupied these campfires around the town. Now, I verified several times if there really were 200 of these campfires around the town. It was hard to believe at first because in a town of 18,000 people, that's a lot of people getting involved. Now, what I think that tells you, though, is that one of the, the most beautiful things about nonviolent resistance is that so many people can participate. Right? Um, and toast marshmallows, of course. <laughs> now, what happened? Uh, when it came time for elections to take place in November, the town said that they did not want to elect a mayor. They wanted to have, uh, they wanted the, uh, the, govern the government of their town to be consisted of a council of 12 people from the town, a governing council that was based on what in Mexico was called usos y costumbres, or uh, traditional ways and customs. There have been other towns in Mexico that have done this, but what made Chiran, I think, unique is that they pursued a, a strategy. They pursued a, a double strategy where uh, not only did they to say that they were going to disobey any legal obligation to elect one single mayor, they also pursued in the courts their legal right to elect that governing council. And they won. They actually were very smart in their legal strategy, and they were able to, in a sense, pit the state electoral court against the federal electoral court, given those rivalries that I already told you about, the PRD in the state of Michoacan and the PAN on a national level. And they were uh, granted legal authority by a, a federal electoral court to have a 12-person governing council. Well, what happened? 
even before the council was actually sworn in, crime went down dramatically in the town. Illegal logging is still going on, but at a much slower rate than before. And what's important is that they've also unified their struggle with a broader movement against the drug war in Mexico. As I said in the beginning, many of you have heard about the drug war, and the narrative is often cast in terms of so many dead, so m this many people died, this is horrible, this cannot be won. We have to keep with the same failed strategy. And what Chiran offers is an actual example of people organizing, taking things into their own hands, and winning. And so it's been become one of the most important components of a broader movement against the drug war in Mexico. It also, I think, shows you again, the way we were talking about earlier, uh, the enemy was, of course, or the opponent, uh, Harry's going to yell at me if I use the term enemy, I don't know. <laughs> The opponent was organized crime, but they were able to actually separate all these different interlocked pillars of power in order to achieve their examples. Of course, there was a very porous relationship between government and organized crime, and by combating corrupt government, they were able to take away some of the strengths and some of the allies that organized crime had. They were also able to drive a wedge between state, the power of the state government and the power of the federal government. They were able to see all these cracks between all these interlocked structures of power and use it to their advantage. It's also become an inspiration for all the indigenous movements in Mexico that have struggled to create an autonomous form of government and in many cases have been brutally repressed because their combination of nonviolent direct action and legal strategy has provided uh, to be a winning combination. So uh, that's a very, very rough outline of what has happened in Chiran. It's a wonderful, inspiring story, but I want to stop here so that we can have some questions before we have to break. <laughs>